Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. I just thought I'd start off by saying that this is exciting for us because this is truly a Berkman collaboration. So Aaron and I were both fellows a couple of years ago at Berkman, and that's when we decided to work together on this project. So it's really a Berkman project. Um, and in true collaborative form, we're going to present it together. Um, you should feel free to interrupt us if we say something where you'd like clarification. Um, and yeah, so Aaron will start with uh, motivation for the project, research questions. I'll talk a little bit about the data and some of the findings, and then I'll pass it back to Aaron. Sounds good. Thanks, Oscar. Um, OK. So the place this paper started um, was really with these questions about what the Obama campaign meant for political engagement, and particularly the relationship between the internet and political engagement among young people. And so Esther has this amazing survey data about a lot of college students in Chicago, which she will tell you more about in a moment. And uh, so what we were really interested in was to come up with a way to test this idea, to do a pretty strong test for the idea that you know, Obama, the Obama campaign had really changed the game um, in terms of young people's online engagement. And so we thought, what better place to look at this than a bunch of Chicago college students? Um, and in particular, what we wanted to see was um, whether internet use patterns matter, which is something that previous research on young people's political engagement hadn't really included data about. So Esther will tell you more about what our data has to say about that in a minute. Um, so we read a lot about what, was, what previous research had found on this. And the main findings are probably familiar to a lot of you in some ways. Um, in various forms. The big, the big story of young voter engagement over the past 50 years in the US is generally, generally summarized as a pretty sad one. Um, insofar as there's been a, generally a downward trend in terms of young voters becoming increasingly disaffected that may have been changing in the past eight years, but you know, long-term trend seems to be generally downwards. And um, past research in terms of what the internet has meant for this and what people's use of the internet has meant in relation to this trend has seemed to suggest that the internet is usually a weapon of the strong. Or in other words, the people who have greater social capital, greater resources, come from privileged backgrounds, tend to make more and better use of the internet. And that re the relationship between the internet use and political engagement only holds for those people from more privileged backgrounds. So. The other piece of the previous research has been this kind of argument about whether the internet impacts political engagement directly or whether there's, and whether it, inter, inter, whether it affects people's political engagement uniformly or whether there's some other more complicated process. So um, kind of what factors intervene, what processes matter more than others. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of agreement on that in terms of the social science sources that we looked at. So that's where we started. Um, and we decided to think about political engagement in terms of four specific outcomes. So I'm just going to walk through these a little bit um, as sort of a preface to what the models that we actually ran. Um, the first is what we called online political cognitive engagement. And what that translates into is the extent to which you pay attention to or participate in uh, sort of political information seeking and political communication on the internet. Um, and the second one is civic engagement. And that's, we're really interested here in sort of traditional forms of civic engagement. So volunteer organizations, participation in the community, um, things that people don't necessarily do online, but that they may do online. But you know, sort of the classic, uh, if you've read Bowling Alone, Bob Putnam's book on civic engagement, social capital, you'll have an idea of what we were thinking of in this area. Um, of course, we were interested in voting as an outcome as well. Um, that's the sort of obvious one. Um, and we were also interested in political action more broadly defined. So Esther will have more about what specifically went into that measure. But as you can see from the arrows here, the other piece of this is that we were using, the way we were running the models is we were trying to incorporate these in a cumulative way. So implicitly what that means is we were, we were assuming that certain things about people's attributes might affect the extent to which, might associate with the extent to which they engage, engage politically online which in turn might associate with the extent to which they you know, are civically engaged, which in turn might associate with the extent to which they vote or engage in other forms of political action. So that's the kind of 
10,000 foot overview of what we were doing and pass it to Esther for the data piece. Okay, so now I'll tell you about the data that we're using. So some of you know about my work and you know that I've done a lot of uh, data collection at the University of Illinois Chicago. So I'll just say a few words about why there. I've never been affiliated with that institution myself. Um, so it's not about just simply surveying my students. Um, the reason that I've been studying students at, the, at UIC is that it's an ex extremely diverse group of students. Um, it's one of the most ethnically diverse campuses in the nation when it comes to research universities. And so that is helpful when one is interested in the kinds of questions that drive my work, which have to do with uh, social inequality with respect to internet uses. So that's why we um, use a data set from UIC. Uh, what we do is, um, or what I, I did with my research, research team at Northwestern, um, is going to a class at UIC that everybody is required to take on campus every first year. So this way we're not biasing towards some type of class that people might be interested in taking. Um, and uh, I'm very grateful for the first year writing program for working with me on this. Um, it is a paper pencil survey, which is less and less common. Uh, a lot of surveys are done online these days. The reason that uh, I continue to use paper pencil surveys is that a lot of the uh, outcomes of interest have to do with internet uses, and so I don't want to mix the mode of data collection with the research questions of interest. So that way I, I want to remove questions such as who has access to the internet more, who's more comfortable taking these surveys online from the mode of data collection. So that's why it's paper pencil survey. Um, it might sound simple, one course, paper pencil, going to class. It's actually 80 86 different sections, so it's a lot of work to <laughs> collect all this data. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, Okay, so uh, the data, uh, these data come from the spring of 09, uh, where we had over a, a thousand first years take the survey with quite a high response rate. Um, we today focus on just a thousand one of those students who were actually eligible to vote because um, we're not really interested in the students right now who are not eligible to vote since that's one of our important outcomes. Um, okay, so just we'll tell you a little bit here about what the sample looks like. So, oh, sorry. Yes. Were those students who were elig eligible to vote in 2008, or are they ones who were eligible to vote starting in 2009? Um, this was for the 08 elections. Uh, so the majority of the students are 18 or 19. Uh, they're uh, young. Uh, we have a bit more females than males in the sample. Parental education is the variable you, we use as a proxy for socioeconomic status. You can see that almost half of the sample is first generation college students. Again, it's a pretty diverse sample and also quite diverse on race and ethnicity. That said, we do want to remind you that this is a specific population. So we don't want to suggest that our findings are generalizable to all of the US, but we think that it's a very interesting population, especially given that it's Obama's hometown. Um, so, 62% of the students in the sample voted in the presidential elections, which compares uh, very well with the figures nationally for that age group and education level. So this is actually, in that sense, quite representative, very similar numbers. We collected data on what we call political capital, what the literature uh, suggests are variables that might matter when it comes to political engagement, just so we can control for these. So one has to do with uh, partisanship, um, we have information on people's level of political interest and also political knowledge. And we relied on pretty standard ways to measure these. If people are interested in more detail, we can get into that. Would range be like bank of partisanship from? Okay, so I guess I'll get into how we <laughs> measured these. Um, so uh, the partisanship question specifically came from, or variable, came from a question that actually asked people about their ideology from uh, very liberal all the way to very conservative, where we coded very liberal and very conservative as three on the partisanship, liberal or conservative as two, and middle of the road as one. So we recoded that, that question. Um, okay. This is definitely the wired generation, so people talk about this cohort as people who've grown up with technology, and indeed we do find that when it comes to very basic levels of internet use, they've really been online for many years, and um, so there are not, no questions of a core digital divide when it comes to this population. So that's something that we've pretty much controlled for by looking at this group. 
However, when it comes to more nuanced measures of internet use, there is some variability in the group. So these are measures that, again, the literature would suggest might matter for internet use, some of it. Um, measures that I've introduced, for example, people's level of skill in using the internet. Um, just to clarify, the range here refers to what the options were in the survey questions. Those are not the minimum and maximum values of the responses. So for example, everyone's been online already um, by the time of the study. Okay, so on to our uh, important question of what we call online political cognitive engagement. So the way we operationalized this was to look at a few questions that have to do specifically with engaging with political types of content online. And we look at two types. One has to do with blogs in particular. Are you reading blogs that relate to um, politics? But it's actually a pretty broad category, including economics, law, policy. That's how th those were the words used in the survey. Um, are you commenting on these types of blogs? Also looking at whether you visit websites with these topics and whether you engage with content in a more active way of this sort, as in do you forward, do you post, do you respond to this kind of content? And so these are the figures, which we show you because this is such a central uh, variable in the study. So note that the, the most of the numbers under never are quite high actually, right? So we have a lot of people in the sample, a lot of these young adults who are not really engaging with this type of material online. And especially when it comes to the more active form of commenting, of engaging with the material by forwarding, um, those numbers are very high, meaning that uh, about, it's really just one fifth at maximum who are doing any of that work. Mary. Uh, I missed it, you said it. Did you specifically at any point of what you meant by political or economic or law policy? No, this was just, this just is what word. it said, okay. yeah. So uh, what we then did was we created a, a summary variable of this information. Uh, that's just a binary variable where if you did any of these things weekly or more often, um, that's where you get a one on that zero one binary variable, which is about half the sample. So then we ran uh, a logistic regression with uh, information about people's background, political capital measures, and some of the internet measures to see what relates to online political cognitive engagement. And instead of showing you the raw numbers from the regression, um, we'll came up with this representation. Let's see if it works. Uh, basically, what we found that women are less likely to engage uh, with this kind of material online race and ethnicity, as well as parental education, which is our proxy for socioeconomic status, do not seem to matter, don't relate. Um, interest in politics does. This is not shocking. You're interested in politics. You're more likely to be engaging with this kind of material on the web. Um, and also, how often you're online and your skill uh, are positively related to online political cognitive engagement. Next, we looked at civic engagement. As Aaron mentioned earlier, we rely on fairly traditional measures of these. These are specifically what we asked on the survey and what we use data on. And um, this is how prevalent these types of uh, activities, engagements were in the sample. And what we did here was we added up the number of these that you um, did, either ever or in the cases where you see in parentheses a few times a week or more. And so here we have, the, we have a, an interval outcome from zero to four. Yes? Back one, uh, did you uh, control women and internet skill together? Well, it's, it's a regression, so it's all in the model at the same time. Is that what you're asking? I'm wondering whether that, that, the, the, the negative effect of, of, uh, is independent of or is dependent on um, you know, internet skill kind of. So actually what we did with the models was we first ran a model with just the background variables and then we added the internet variables. And I remember for sure that when we add the internet variables, that is a negative relationship. So controlling for skill. It's still. It, yes. So now the outcome is this zero to four uh, interval variable of civic engagement, your level of civic engagement. And here, gender doesn't seem to matter. However, Asian Americans seem to be more engaged uh, than whites. Parental education matters in the sense that those whose parents have higher levels of education engage more 
uh, civically interest in politics is related. OPC engagement refers to our online political cognitive engagement measure. So there's a positive relationship there with engaging online in political types of content and being civically engaged, whether online or offline. Um, and internet experiences when it comes to autonomy, your use of social network sites and skill are all positively related. Nicole. Um, could you talk a little bit about why you decided to focus on blogs as a, as for the political engagement? as opposed to news groups or chat rooms or... So actually groups. the latter is included in the other. So it's it's four measures, two types. One has to do specifically with blogs, and the other is a much more general question that just said, when do you go online to look at these types of content, which is actually inclusive of, it could be news groups, it could be okay. just a, a, a newspaper website, anything. So that's very inclusive. We specifically just highlighted blogs as a separate question just to focus in on that because it's gotten so much attention, but that's like an add-on. Okay. It's not replacing other types of... Okay, so that measure there. This one measure, it's all those four. So reading, looking at blogs, other types of political content, plus commenting on blogs, plus forwarding an article you read in the New York Times, like all of that is supposed to be okay. included. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah, another question. No, 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 not at all. No, nothing. Good that's question. Nothing. Thank you yeah, for asking. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. That's just uh, trying to fit it all in. Another quick question. I saw it. You mean secular. So you're not making any distinction in terms of whether or not they're involved through a religious organization? Over a semester by the time we are collecting the data, right? So things that college may afford them to do, they could be doing already. Right, right. That said, I do think... One area that would be really intriguing to follow up on here is what it is exactly that's going on on social network sites that they're doing. We, I didn't specify what those data were about, but basically that variable is simply, do you check people's status updates and do you post status updates to yourself with some regularity? That's a pretty crude measure of SNS use for our purposes. It would be great if we had some more nuance there SNS use specifically for political types of purposes, for example. That would be neat to have. We've had lots of hands up. Um, okay, well, thanks, go ahead. I might be misunderstanding your final sort of simplified version of your results, but it seems somewhat paradoxical that um, internet use doesn't correlate to voting, but internet use does correlate with political action. I Doesn't voting correlate or should we assume that voting correlates with political action or is that a false assumption or is the data more nuanced in a way that you can't simply make a chain rule and come out with a paradox? So they, I mean, they do relate. The political action and voting are related. Okay, Absolutely. so they are. They're so, related in the So data is, am I, am I correct in understanding somewhat of a paradox here or is that just an artifact of how the data is filtered? It's nothing to do with what we did with the data. I think it's, it might just be a paradox in, in the way that political engagement and action work among American young people. I mean, I think voting is, at least qualitatively, a different kind of engagement in the United States than signing petitions, donating, volunteering for campaigns. And I think part of what we find is that it's reflected insofar as the kinds of people who tend to vote more look a little different than the kinds of people who do those other things more. Um, so I'm not sure... I'm not sure it's a paradox, strictly speaking, but it's definitely, it's interesting to disaggregate them and think about them separately, I think, for exactly this reason. And it suggests that um, <laughs> some of the things that, you know, some of the factors that drive whether people vote or not, you know, may not necessarily overlap with the factors that determine whether people are engaging in a broader sense. Um, so, I, you know, I'm hesitant to draw it. I don't want to, like, extrapolate from these to claim that any of this was clearly causal in any way, but I think that it's suggestive in that regard. So that's the, yeah. We should, I mean, I sh we should mention that the R square of these models is around, I think the best fit is what explains 12% of the variance. Yeah, it's not, most. it's not so, humongous. I mean, yeah. There are lots of things that we're not including in the models that we have no data on that matter. So we're, we're just capturing a, a, you know, a relatively small portion of, the variance, to be sure, most internet use research, that's about as much as you're going to get. So in that sense, we're in line with research. But there's obviously other things going on, too, that we're just not capturing. Yes? I follow up on this question about 
I mean, it goes back to the what is elig eligibility. Um, would a student be considered eligible or self-identified as eligible if they had um, moved from out of state? Oh, you know what? This is a point I had meant to mention. Yeah, it yeah, wasn't yeah, on the slide. I forgot. The vast majority of the students in the sample are from Chicago land. So, so specifically from the Chicago area. We actually, we have, we haven't included it here. We have the data. Mm -hmm. Almost everybody is from Chicago land. Just literally just a handful who aren't. So <laughs> that's actually not uh, really a concern with this data set. Yeah. That said, the question was about the presidential election. So, so they would yeah. say they're eligible. Even if you could be from people are more likely to vote or not when when they're away that and that's a very yeah, legitimate a really question, question. Um, which is why I should have mentioned that almost everybody in the sample is from Illinois yes yeah. I'm just wondering how active is the democratic party for independent squad in Illinois how active are they I have no idea that's a good question but yeah, no I don't idea. Know. Did you yeah. The question? How, oh, sorry. The question was how active the Democratic Club is at the university. Yeah, or how various party how groups might or might not no be. No information on that. There has been, I know there's at least one study that was done at Northwestern about sort of get out the vote outreach efforts by specific groups and their effect in the student on the student body there and their participation rates. But um, we definitely don't have that information for this sample. So it would be interesting to look and see whether there are findings in that area. And that work by Michael Pekshkin was actually yes, especially focused on the idea that at Northwestern, a lot of the students are from out of state. And so they're trying to get people registered. That wouldn't be that easy. But again, with the with our population, it's they're local. So it's the, there totally isn't different. that extra hurdle. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, you said you, looked, you had later data about the gubernatorial race. Um, did you look at any other voting, uh, as in like smaller level local voting? Or are you looking at like the larger level voting? Uh, I have no data on other types of voting. Um, yeah, and so far with this, we've only looked at the 2009 Yeah, we haven't actually looked at results. the 2010 data. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, you had a question here? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there was a study that came out recently showing that uh, something like 85% of contributors to Wikipedia were male. <laughs> and I was wondering if you have looked into, uh, since you do collect data on gender, if you saw anything similar related to online political participation in your sample set. <coughs> so... I mean, we, we yeah, I don't showed the, here. We can go back to here. We just have the models. We don't have the breakdown by gender. I can, I mean, I could tell you that Wikipedia contributions, I actually have very nuanced data Yeah, Esther data has done wonderful on research on exactly this topic, <laughs> which is um, elsewhere. But, I, yeah. And in particular in the 2010 data set, I have very detailed information separately. Have you edited? Have you started a new entry? Uh -huh. Have you... Looked at the history, like I have about six or seven different measures, okay. and it's unbelievably gendered. I mean, it's the the data are almost even more extreme than the, what you're quoting. The Wikimedia quoting. survey. Um, wow. I could even pull up the. I know I have a, a slide <laughs> it's afterwards. In there somewhere. I'll show you. Yeah, yeah. I have a slide that actually has those data, and it's remarkable. I mean, we're talking extremely large differences from the 2009 data set. I remember the figures were. Just generally asking, have you added or edited a Wikipedia entry? 29% of the men said they had, and 8% of the women said they had. So that's a huge difference. But when we look at the specifics of ver edit versus add versus all those things, there's some even larger differences. So yeah, those are huge. Now, as to political, um, I mean, I guess on these slides, we don't have the specific breakdown. But yeah. gender, I mean... But gender did matter. I mean, this is this was the this one model, that yeah, gender, speaks to that. Yeah. Even when you control for all these other factors, mm -hmm. women are, are still doing it less. So, no, it's not as drastic. No, no. Yeah. I don't remember offhand Those the magnitude. Contribution of the, yeah. types of activities from my prior research, and actually, some of it, I I think I talked about in my last Berkman talk. Mm -hmm. um, they are always gendered. That women are contributing less on pretty much everything I've looked at. And one of the critiques I got at that point, I looked at contributing to Wikipedia, I looked at posting videos, I looked at um, blogging, creating quizzes. Maybe that was the one that wasn't, there was no gender difference. That's right. I, yeah, that's right. Uh, as in like Facebook quizzes probably. Right. Um, and then the one critique I kept getting was, oh, but you didn't ask about fan fiction. <laughs> so in 2010, I asked about fan fiction and women are still reporting less for that too. Yeah. So... 
Now, and then you can start asking, well, is there some misreporting here? But I don't, I can't really come up, I mean, as a survey researcher with a lot of experience uh, using survey, I can't really come up with a reason why systematically that would be misreported. So if people have ideas, let me know, but I, I haven't been able to say that, that there's like a reason that that would be misreported in that way, you know, biased way. Can we, sorry. Yes, it's inc it's inclusive of both in this case. And then does the data suggest that women actually read less political news online? I don't remember offhand. I'm sure that we looked at that, but uh, in just a descriptive way at some point. Yeah, where's the here's the? I mean, we could if 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 you hang around for a few minutes afterwards, we can we check can the crosstab. The but I mean, uh, I don't know offhand what it was. Because the Wikipedia the Wikipedia information is. It's production. Specifically production. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, I can say, so specifically for Wikipedia, in terms of have you read a Wikipedia entry, mm -hmm. it's like 99% for both men and women. So that's universal yeah. for Wikipedia in particular. For th these measures, I don't remember I don't right remember. now what yeah, the cross tabs are. Um, well, we it, it may be that men do a little bit more, uh, but I don't recall major variation there. I David. I understand that you put partisanship as a single measure of strength, not as uh, where you are. Um, but if you put back in, I don't know if you have the data, but if you put back in left versus right. Ideology. Yeah. Does it make a difference? Um, have we done that? I don't think we did do that. I think, I we, think we did that. In part because I think... Um, like the previous work in this area, I mean, the motivation for doing it the way we did it is just the previous work, previous work in this area has been overwhelming that it's partisanship, not ideology, that matters. But in this particular case, I think it, you raise a good point that um, given the geography and the population involved, it would be worth going back. So, yeah, we haven't done it yet. Something we could do. It's a great idea. It indicates something about the Obama effect. Absolutely. Although right. we yeah, never yeah, know, right. we could be, you know, energizing the uh, right as well. So. <laughs> who identified as very passionately one thing as opposed to another voted more. So that's the partisanship variable? Yes. I, yeah. I think so. We do control for that. Oh, no, it, the it, question? It does, if we go back to the model for uh, voting, oh. if we go to the voting outcome model. Uh, Yes. So, <laughs> that's not a shock either. That you found that the more partisan. The people who are more. So, the plus sign right. next to political capital and the fact that partisanship is listed there oh, okay. means that people who are more partisan were more likely to vote. And was there any difference between men and women now? Did you know? So, the idea is that we're including information about all these variables at the same time in the model. Mm. So, holding one constant the other is significant? Yeah, the way to read it is sort of like all other things being equal, women were more likely to vote than, were like more likely to have voted according to this data than men. So if you take all men other and things women being equal, are right. at the equal level of partisanship, the women are more likely to vote than the men. Right. Interesting. Yeah, that's sort of the way to read these. Although you have to be careful with that more likely piece because that yeah. suggests that it's linear causal. Yeah, I mean, and yeah. that's not it's complicated. Right. Lots of variables. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. So just to go, just to go further and drill a little bit down into this point. Women vote as a percentage more often than anybody, right? This is, this nationally, is, I think. Nationally, that's nationally that's the case, right? So, is there then even less effect on women? So, if you have women who are voting more, and you're seeing, you're not seeing a correlation, then is there even less pull on women? Because they're a larger, sort of, they're naturally motivated to vote out. more often. Yeah, I mean, these wouldn't let us. Yeah, this know wouldn't. That. I mean, this kind of method wouldn't do that because the mechanics of it don't like. Yeah, don't let us look at that. It would be interesting to try to figure out if there's a way to pull that out. I'm not sure what it would look like. like yeah, maybe it would just be an interaction. Yeah, we could try it. Just because if you, if you think about what you, if you sort of step back from what you're saying, right? You're saying that men 
produce more content, engage with more content, mm -hmm. but women still vote more. Right, but in fact, the engaging with the content here doesn't matter. It, so yeah, we're right. controlling for that. That doesn't matter. Right. Um, so maybe if we if we interacted those the online some of the online variables. Yeah, it would be interesting to to try work. it with. Yeah. It would be worth probably going back, if we were to do this, it would be worth going back and looking more at the descriptives of the population right. to pull out plausible stories like that and then go in and specifically look at those interactions, um, which I don't know if we did very much. I don't think we did very much of when no. we first generated this. Yeah. So that's we a great point. We were very much led by the literature. We yeah, just, yeah. We wanted to test what the literature has said and see how can we measure how we stack up and yeah. then how does this compare. But that's a great point. That that's a good one to good one to think about. So we should go back to that one. Rob. Um, yeah. Question. One is uh, of all the things you didn't measure, what's the thing you really wish you had a measure of? <laughs> and and the second one is getting back to the voting and political participation thing. So, so I, I understand the logic of having different determinants of civic engagement and political engagement being driven by different things. But my prior assumption would have been that political engagement and voting would be more or less linear. It would be on the same trajectory and that the determinants of the both would be similar as well. Do you, do you have a theory or a hypothesis as to why they're not the same? Or I mean, to go backwards, I think the second part of your question is actually <coughs> goes back to the question moment is too, yeah. which is, and, and I, I mean, beyond the fact that I think they are qualitatively different in American society, I don't have a good story there. I don't know if you have more to, um, I mean, they're not, they're not perfectly correlated so there's definitely, in terms of looking at the correlations between those two, they're not, it doesn't line up exactly. So it's definitely not something that is sort of there in the, even if, even if you know, in a certain way we can sort of say from a high level, like political engagement of these different kinds should be created more or less equally. Um, it's apparently not. So that's, I mean, that's sort of the best I can do, unfortunately. I don't know beyond that uh in terms of measures that we wish we had do you have any that uh well i mean i actually i mean i'm actually pretty proud of this data set and how much we do have information it's pretty on. amazing yeah, yeah um i think with the internet variables i'd love to have more detail there like i as i said like i would love to know what's going on on social network sites that matters i think it'd be interesting to have maybe more although i do think the opc the online political cognitive engagement does actually capture a lot so you could have more nuance but since in some cases it doesn't matter i don't know if it would help yeah. um but i i do think that it would be interesting to see more of the nuances there especially with the with some of these newer technologies but I, do you have thoughts or does other people we'd love to hear you know the other question i was going to ask is is do people <clears throat> look at the impact of social networks on on voting behavior and political there's like, been some other work on as that. As in yeah. just like, like when your what, networks what your are voting. Yeah. And yeah. I, I mean, I'm sure there's literature on this. I don't think we really looked at that here. Although, 